uh, let's begin lecture then. So uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, two topics. Uh, one is the scalable algorithms for handling uh, large data, big data and big models, and as well as the software systems and the principles behind those systems that complement these algorithms in order to allow, uh, for example, machine learning researchers and practitioners to scale their applications up uh, to the kinds of data, large data, but also large model scales that are demanded uh, in demand today. Um, so I, you know, just to set the stage, I think we're all familiar with the very large uh, data scales that are being generated today, uh, driven primarily by the growth of the uh, internet, as well as sensor data or other types of uh, data collection devices, collectively known as the internet of things. Um, this slide here is a little bit out of date, but you can see that even a couple of years ago, uh, just the big, biggest websites on earth uh, produced so much data that for their machine learning teams to be able to do analysis across the entire company's data uh, would require computational resources, maybe far in excess of what we're used to doing as student projects, for instance. Um, simultaneously, there's been a continuous growth in uh, model sizes. Uh, if we look at uh, modern machine learning models, it's not uh, atypical. It's pretty common, in fact, for models to be in excess of uh, 100 million parameters, uh, all the way up to uh, billions of parameters for models that have uh, dense parameters. Or for models that are sparsely defined, that number can even go up to the trillions, actually. So, um, and already, uh, this, these are just some examples of models that were used in the past, uh, say, five, five to eight years for different kinds of tasks. And again, it's pretty common for the number of parameters to be in excess of the billions. Well, what does this actually mean? If you think about how much uh, even storage or RAM a machine or G a CPU or GPU has access to, that's typically on the order of maybe 16 to 128 gigabytes. But if you think, think about what a parameter is, uh, a parameter is basically a floating point number. If that's four bytes, then if we're talking about one to 10 billion, we're talking about model parameter, uh, model images that are between you know, four to 40 gigabytes or even 400 gigabytes in size. So different types of parallel uh, or distributed ML scalable ML techniques are needed just to be able to even train the model because it may not fit into memory. Uh, now, the other thing I want to talk about is there's something we call the scalability challenge in that uh, when we all start doing parallel programming or distributed programming for the first time, we often like to think that if I've got, uh, say, eight computers, then my task is going to be eight times faster. Uh, in reality, just like uh, when you're trying to coordinate a group of people to work on a project, there are communication overheads, so you won't actually get linear scalability. Your objective is really to try to get near linear scalability. That's the blue line here. You're always going to do slightly worse than uh, this dotted line, which represents if I've got eight machines, I'm eight times faster. However, what tends to happen uh, if one is not familiar with the mathematical details or systems details of scalable ML, uh, you end up with this uh, red line here, which is you may have created a working parallel or distributed program or even ML program, but it doesn't actually scale with the number of machines as you thought it would. Uh, at that point, um, you have to go in deeper and you have to try to understand what went wrong. Okay. So, in order to address the topics of big data, big model, and the scalability challenge, uh, we need to do some, uh, say, some preliminaries here. So we're going to present, uh, say, a kind of a, a high-level view of ML models and tools from a mathematical perspective for one of the many families you see here on the diagram. And then this ML model, which is a mathematical equation, right? it's solved by an ML algorithm which uh, there's only a few major types of them uh, compared to the wider variety of models. So Markov chain Monte Carlo optimization, matrix and spectral algorithms are some of the major families we'll talk about today. Uh, so 
example, the uh, kinds of probabilistic programs which are solved, for example, via uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods or even some types of variational optimization or inference methods uh, include well-known graphical models such as, uh, say, uh, topical models or the many uh, types of Bayesian graphical models that exist out there. Uh, these are all have probabilistic definition. Uh, on the other side, we have optimization programs, which include uh, classical programs like most regression or classification applications, uh, whether on uh, classical statistical models or whether on, for example, uh, deep learning architecture, such as convolutional, recurrent or transformer, are typically formulated as an optimization program. Uh, in reality, the line between these two categories is, uh, as you might have learned during the course, uh, fairly blurred in that most probabilistic programs these days incorporate elements of uh, complex optimization functions and any optimization program can actually be uh, kind of fairly easily converted into a probabilistic program by putting priors on certain uh, parameters or functional uh, variables for instance. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is that to think about both probabilistic and optimization programs in a unified way uh, we want to look at them uh, as part of a single master equation, which is this uh, iterative convergent view of uh, ML algorithms. Iterative convergent meaning that it iterates towards a solution and you know we have theoretical guarantees of the algorithms that are used that it will converge to you know some type of fixed point or optimum. So in this iterative convergent view, you know, some notational notation here, let theta be the, uh, represent all of the model parameters. Let the superscript T represent the iteration index. So starting from T equals one all the way to uh, whatever it stops. Uh, and let, you know, delta F be basically an update function on the, fun on the parameters theta, which takes in the data D. So fairly simple definition, and we'll see how this applies to different programs, uh, different ML programs and algorithm, models and algorithms shortly. Uh, another principle I want to talk about is that in, in the majority of computer science, uh, most algorithms need what we call operational co correctness. Uh, take a classic example like sorting. Uh, if we're sorting numbers and we make a single error inside the algorithm, then the output is guaranteed to you know, more or less persist and not be corrected. So you can see over here, if I do a merge sort incorrectly and swap uh, two of the numbers here, that output error is going to persist all the way to the final output. So a single error in, a, in most computer science programs will, or most computer programs will cause an error in the final output. Uh, but for machine learning programs, uh, they're able to self-heal in a sense because they are all um, algorithms that converge towards a local optimum. Uh, so even if you, the point is that even if you added some noise or error into the trajectory, the algorithm is essentially able to correct for that because it's kind of, the analogy is kind of like you're climbing a mountain. If you can see the peak all the time, uh, even if you, uh, you know, made some, you know, pathing error up the mountain, you're still, as long as you're able to see the peak or know where it approximately is, you'll still make progress towards it. So this turns out to be a very important property that uh, is actually the key behind many scalable ML uh, techniques. Uh, how, and you'll see, you know, in this lecture that the types of parallelization techniques uh, can be quite different from what you see in uh, traditional computer science. Okay, given that iterative convergent view uh, of, you know, parameters uh, equals, you know, an update on uh, the previous value of the parameters plus an update, I want to generalize that a little bit more to kind of set the mathematical framework. So let's talk about ML programs in a general form where you're doing a maximization or minimization of over the parameters given the loss function L over data, uh, which can be supervised, which can be unsupervised. Here I'm just showing a, a supervised version which has, uh, you know, axis i's and labels yi, the parameters theta, uh, and then uh, this omega, which is a structure-inducing function I'll talk about a little bit. And the iterative convergent algorithm is really a loop from iteration, you know, t equals one to t, where the core equation is an update, uh, again, from theta t, to theta t plus one based on the data. 
this is a more general form where uh, the delta F, which could be a gradient step, which could be a Markov chain Monte Carlo sample, is aggregated using a uh, function G. Uh, but for uh, many algorithms, it actually simplifies to the form I showed uh, in the previous slide, which is this equation here. Okay. Just to give you know, some flavor here, uh, for an optimization program, let's take something as simple as, uh, say, uh, lit uh, linear lasso regression. You often have in the big data setting a huge volume of data. Let's say you have one billion samples. So your matrix Y is going to be uh, an n by one or a one billion by one matrix. You have an X matrix, which is uh, let's say you have n dimensional data. So it's an n by n matrix. And then even the number of parameters here represented by beta is a very large number. M equals uh, one billion. So this is uh, uh, basically an, uh, an n by one matrix. And then if we take a look at, say, a probabilistic setting, let's look at a classical example like topic modeling. Uh, if I wanted to do topic modeling on, uh, say, one billion documents, then you have basically three matrices you need to maintain for a Markov chain Monte Carlo implementation. A one billion uh, rows uh, matrix uh, times the number of topics. So times the number of topics, which in the largest applications could be up to millions or, or even more. And then uh, another matrix, which is say a million topics by uh, a million different unique vocabulary words, sometimes actually several million, and the third matrix. So these three matrices, uh, the point is the largest ones of them can be uh, have one of the dimensions being in the millions or even billions. Having said that, there are two general strategies we can take to parallelize an ML program. So they are, roughly you can think of them as data parallel and model parallel. And the distinction is actually uh, kind of intuitive, although we'll see later some of the fine grained details. So in the data parallel case, what you're doing is if I have say eight computing devices, eight machines to, to parallelize the, or even eight CPUs or eight GPUs on a single machine, I'm going to assign each uh, machine or CPU or GPU a different subset of the data, uh, you know, represented here by D sub one all the way to D sub N. And I'm going to have each of them compute the Delta function, uh, the update function on their piece of data and then aggregate them somehow. Uh, model parallel is the uh, is kind of the the counterpart to it, where instead of splitting the data across different computing devices, I'm going to give the full data to each uh, to each computer, and then I'm going to uh, uh, assign the responsibility for calculating different updates to different parts of theta. If theta is a matrix, then I'm going to partition this matrix up and give the responsibility of computing delta, theta, sub one, all the way to sub k to different devices. Okay, so that was the first part, uh, the very first introduction part of the lecture to set some background. Uh, I want to pause here and ask, uh, are there any questions before I move on to, to the lecture proper? Okay, uh, looks like everything is clear, no further questions. So, uh, just to give you an outline, we're going to, uh, we're going to start by talking about optimization uh, algorithms, uh, stochastic gradient descent, quarter descent, and the proximal gradient methods, and how we uh, parallelize and scale them up to handle the, the big data, big model challenge. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Markov chain model algorithms in the next part of the lecture, and then after that, we're going to move on to uh, scalable ML systems and their principles. Okay, so without further ado, uh, we're going to use a, uh, a running example throughout the optimization part of this lecture. And uh, we're going to use actually, for example, sparse linear regression as a motivating example. So to do a little bit of a recap here, as I'm sure you've learned earlier in lecture, uh, in lecture series, um, a program, uh, most optimization programs consist of two parts. A part that you can intuitively, uh, intuitively think of as data fitting. So you want to find the parameters here called uh, beta that fits into the data using some kind of uh, loss function. In this case here, that's a basically a squared loss. 
And then you also have a often a second part to the optimization program, which is a regularization or structure inducing uh, uh, function. I hope this is not uh, blocking the lecture. Okay. And its point is to introduce uh, structure or assumptions onto the parameters beta. So the key is that this data fitting part depends on data X, Y, and beta, but the regularization part typically only depends on the parameters beta. Uh, we have different examples of uh, omega, which is uh, the structure-inducing function, uh, such as sparsity-inducing functions like the L1 penalty, or you can even have complex structured uh, penalties such as group uh, penalties, tree penalties, overlapping penalties. Uh, these allow you to, you know, uh, encode pretty sophisticated prior assumptions on the parameters. So. The very first algorithm we're going to talk about is uh, perhaps the simplest one, uh, stochastic gradient descent. So if we can write an optimization program as a minimization over an expectation, and oftentimes this expectation simply takes the sum over one i equals one to n of the training data, uh, then in the classical gradient descent setting, what we do is we take the, par we take the parameters uh, here indexed by x and the data d, we compute the, you know, the first order derivative on these on the, uh, with respect to x, and then we sum that over the loss function, the derivative of the loss function from y equals 1 at n, and just apply that as a gradient step to the parameter z. So pretty simple. In stochastic gradient descent, uh, the modification is rather than summing over i equals 1 at n, and then um, you know, taking an expectation, which requires us to divide by n, we're going to pick a random sample leaves of i, which is smaller than n. And then we're going to update the parameters based on an expectation, an empirical expectation computed on just that sample. So what that means is that I'm going to sum from i equals 1 to size of d sub d, and then I'm going to also uh, divide the, the, the sum by 1 over size of d. Okay. So, stochastic gradient descent, uh, some basic uh, facts about it. It converges almost surely to a global optima for complex programs. Uh, and then, whereas traditional uh, SGD, uh, in its actual very first formulation, it computed gradients based on a single sample. So, you literally picked up one sample, computed the gradient, and you applied it there. But what is common these days is to take a mini batch, where I might have a mini batch of, you know, between maybe Ten to several thousand or tens of thousands of samples, uh, and then I average over them. The idea is that, uh, you know, from a statistical intuition perspective, having more samples when you compute the gradient reduces the variance uh, inside uh, how these gradients are distributed. And reducing the variance, as we'll see later in the theory part of this lecture, leads to faster convergence, which means that it takes fewer iterations to converge. The other reason is that when you have multiple samples in a single gradient, you're able to pack that into a vector, and on most computing hardware, whether CPU or GPU, that vector computation uh, is far more efficient than processing samples one at a time, which results in a what we call a throughput speedup. So uh, throughput means that every iteration uh, is computed uh, faster than it would be without these vector operations. The very first parallel implementation of stochastic gradient descent uh, was, you know, kind of uh, described in a paper about 10 years ago, where the idea was, okay, this is a data parallel uh, formulation, but we're going to partition the data to different workers. If I've got uh, K workers, I'm going to split the data K ways. I'm going to have every worker compute the, sto the do the stochastic gradient descent until convergence on each of these data sets. So I've converged on say uh, D sub one all the way to D sub K. And then I'm going to just aggregate all of the parameters together. So, so what does that mean? Basically, I'm going to run for say capital T, big T iterations on every worker. And I'm going to sum all of the uh, parameters together and average across that. So pretty simple. This is an algorithm that only requires the uh, workers to communicate at two times. One is when it's splitting the input data. One is right at the end when all of them have converged and you aggregate and output the estimate. Okay, so um, the problem with this grand descent, as you can imagine, is think about intuitively. If we have a group of people that are working together on a project and you only meet once at the start and once at the end of the project, 
how likely is it that all of them are aligned and are coming to an estimate? In fact, the problem that actually happens in parallel SGD is that different workers may have converged to different local optima in the space of parameters data based on the data subset they got. So when you aggregate them, just because you average the positions of two or three or n optima together does not guarantee that the average is itself an optima. So that's actually a, a kind of a major flaw with this way of doing things. So in the next part, we're going to talk about two improvements to parallel SGD. Uh, one, the first improvement I'm going to talk about is an approach that uh, kind of uses the sparsity that's present in many problems in order to uh, give with high probability that even if I'm not synchronizing or not communicating between the workers in an ideal fashion, I'm still going to be able to converge to a good optima. So let's say that our optimization function has a has some type of structure where um, every, every uh, the main objective function f can actually be split into different uh, objectives f sub e, where every e touches only a small set of uh, uh, parameters. Uh, and this actually uh, happens when you use, for example, uh, naturally sparse data inside a linear or, or, or logistic or even lasso regression. Uh, because what happens is that if I take a random sample, say uh, 1,000 samples out of 1 million data samples, I will only find that instead of touching, say, the full set of parameters, they might touch only 10% of the parameters. Um, uh, classic way this happens is in, for example, many um, internet companies where they maintain their user profiles. It's often as a pretty high dimensional vector of uh, different, uh, say, one hot encoding. So maybe I, I have subscribed to a page about sports and health about someone else has subscribed to a page about finance and uh, celebrities. Then, you know, my uh, vector, my profile vector, is sparse and so is the other example as well. Okay, so um, just to just give you a flavor that beyond, uh, say, simple regression, there's also different types of uh, optimization uh, 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 optimization functions that uh, also have sparse structure. Uh, SVMs tend to be pretty sparse. Most matrix completion problems, such as the famous Netflix challenge, tend to be sparse. Uh, even the problem of producing a graph partitioning or cut is a sparse uh, problem as well. Um, so the Hogwarts algorithm works like this. Uh, let's say you have again, uh, K different computing devices. I'm going to sample uh, a subset of parameters E at random from the full set. And then for every machine, I'm going to just read the current parameter. I'm going to evaluate the gradient of function on that parameter. And then I'm going to sample uniformly. Uh, I, I'm sorry, let me repeat that again. I'm going to sample uh, E data samples out of the full data. Uh, no, sorry, that's correct. It's going to be E parameters out of the current parameter set. I apologize for that. And then I'm going to sample out of these E parameters. Let's say it's a, it's a million parameter problem and I've sampled, say, 10 parameters. Then I'm going to sample a second time one of the parameters from this subset E. So I've got about 10 parameters, say health, finance, sports, uh, uh, and so on. I'm going to sample exactly one of them, and I'm going to perform stochastic gradient descent on just that parameter with a very small constant step size. So uh, what that happens is that if the data is sparse and if the number of uh, parallel workers is not too big, then with high probability, the subsets E that each of them sample are unlikely to collide with each other. So the advantage of this from an, uh, say a computer programming perspective or software engineering perspective is that since the coordinates picked by each, uh, each parallel worker do not collide with each other, there's no need to do uh, say complex synchronization. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about synchronization in the later part, but for example, you don't have to lock variables, which is a parallel programming technique. It turns out that this does give a nearly the speed up on various ML programs as long as the data is sparse or the uh, objective function has been structured to be sparse. But what's interesting is that this doesn't work that well in the distributed setting. So what is the distributed setting? Uh, 
the distributed setting is when instead of having multiple CPUs and GPUs in one machine, I now have multiple machines and I need the CPUs and GPUs to communicate over the network. Uh, so it turns out that communicating across the network and producing the uh, type of uh, atomically correct updates, which I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but in order to create these atomic updates, it's a more complex programming exercise. And then the second thing that's really interesting is that when you have machines talking to each other over the network, uh, rather than talking to each other on the same machine, it's kind of like, uh, say, instead of doing a teleconference or Zoom video like we're doing now, we're trying to send, um, say, handwritten letters to each other. The delay between machines is actually several orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, and that turns out to be a problem. Why is that? So, in this Hogwarts algorithm, every, every uh, parallel worker is allowed to proceed at full speed uh, and it doesn't really have to communicate with other machines because, again, they don't work on the same parameters. But what happens when, the, when we are trying to communicate, say, via the slow way, via traditional mail, so that that produces a lot of delay? It turns out that there, uh, uh, there's a theorem that uh, you know, Eric and his group developed in 2015 where given some type of objective function f and the step size, you can actually put a bound on how much the delay, uh, which is represented by these quantities epsilon, the mean and variance of the delay, which is the time taken to send letters to each other, uh, affects the uh, affects a uh, basically the uh, expected uh, loss function over here. So the distance between and the intuition is that every step you take in a stochastic graded algorithm decreases the estimate between uh, decreases the distance between the current estimate and uh, some local optima and this is supposed to decrease exponentially in more iterations but because the formula is exponential a high variance in the delay so this is immediate exp 1 over epsilon incurs an exponentially increasing penalty so and like i was saying uh, distributed systems turned out to be several orders of magnitude slower in communication uh, than, uh, say, uh, say, between CPU to memory or GPU to memory. Okay, uh, and then there's additional theorems that I won't go into de too much detail about, but it also, uh, in addition to the convergence being slower, it's also more unstable. I'd encourage you to read uh, this in your, the paper in your own time if you're interested, but the basic intuition you need to have is that having more delay also increases the, var uh, the variance of the parameter. So what do I mean by variance? If I took 10 different runs of this uh, algorithm and compared what optima I go to, we're going to see that with more and more delay, the parameters become uh, kind of more and more spread out. That means there's more variance. That means you're less confident about the optima you converge to. Okay. All right. An alternative uh, strategy uh, which doesn't rely on the sparsity of the, uh, of the objective function of the data is to use what we call a key value store uh, or kind of also known as a parameter server, which you can think of basically as a central memory bank that every worker can talk to. And that memory, that memory bank essentially does the hard work of making sure that uh, everyone, every worker has the same picture of the parameters and it's integrating all the different messages. It's kind of like, you know, you have a project of, people working in a team and one person's assigned to be uh, like the person taking the meeting notes, for instance. There are several synchronization schemes that such a, a key value store parameter server can use. Uh, bulk synchronous parallel, which is used in Hadoop and later successor systems such as Spark. And then there's fully asynchronous uh, parallel communication. And then there's a uh, kind of a middle ground that uh, uh, Eric and this group developed called stale synchronous parallel. Okay. So still synchronous parallel is uh, pretty interesting because the way it works is that it's a synchronization model that is kind of a best of both worlds of the uh, bulk synchronous parallel model as well as the asynchronous uh, parallel model. So what it does is that it's gonna say that I'm gonna give you a window, say three iterations, and then the fastest and slowest parallel workers uh, cannot be more than three iterations apart. So for example, if I have a fast worker that's going all the way to iteration seven and someone hasn't reached iteration four yet, that fast worker is going to be required to stop. And the way this, uh, it stops is that the key value store parameter server 
will not process any request from uh, worker number one until worker number two has caught up. So it's a pretty elegant solution that turns out to have a very simple programming model as we'll see later. So if I were to take, for example, the uh, lasso uh, writing example and turn that into a key value store program, I'm going to basically put the parameters beta in the key value store and it's going to be shared across all workers. Any worker can access it any time. It's just like calling uh, to read or write an array or matrix when you program, say, in Python or C++. Uh, and then we just do a classic uh, SGD. We're going to draw a subset of samples. We don't have to do anything special about choosing different parameters or coordinates. I'm just going to draw a, sample, uh, a subset of samples normally. I'm going to compute the gradient, and I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to just update that. Uh, because this is a lasso program with a sparsity function, we also have to um, account for that. So uh, the common way to do it nowadays is to apply a proximal operator. Uh, and this can actually be done at the workers or it can be done at the key value store itself. So the key value store can also do some computation. Uh, and what happens is that this bounded asynchronous scheme, where some workers are allowed to be a little faster and some are allowed to be a little slower, it allows all the workers to read and write to the parameters beta in a pretty timely fashion, uh, even when the network is slow or unreliable. Okay, and it turns out that, uh, like I was suggesting, uh, bounded synchronous parallel is really kind of like a best of both world solutions. So what happens is that if I take, uh, say, uh, sorry, bounded asynchronous parallel, if I'm going to take, uh, say, uh, bounded synchronous parallel and see how that converges on a classic algorithm, like a classic model, like LDA, uh, this is using Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, we're going to get a convergence curve that looks like this for bounded synchronous parallel. That's the Hadoop or Spark style communication. If I do asynchronous parallel, uh, I'm usually able to get an improvement in the convergence curve. So I'm going to converge to the same objective value in less time, but this is not always uh, guaranteed. It turns out that sometimes uh, the convergence curve will diverge. And then what uh, still about asynchronous parallel allows you to achieve is you get even better performance than uh, say asynchronous execution, but you also have a certain safety guarantee that's present present in bounded synchronous parallel. That is to say, you will not risk, uh, say, a divergence or a poor and uncontrolled convergence of the algorithm. Okay, okay um, I'm going to pause a little bit here uh, as, uh, as I've kind of completed the stochastic gradient descent section and I've introduced three algorithms, uh, naive parallel SGD, uh, as well as uh, the Hogwarts style uh, sparse uh, SGD, and then this idea of using key value stores or parameter servers. I want to pause here and ask, are there any questions so far? Okay, sounds good. Okay, then I'm going to move on to the uh, next part of the optimization uh, section, which is we're going to talk about coordinate descent algorithms. So. Uh, coordinate descent algorithms are kind of naturally suited for model parallel uh, scalable ML implementations because where stochastic gradient descent divides the data set into different samples, coordinate descent is actually dividing up the parameter space into uh, different subsets of parameters. So that's very naturally a model parallel style of algorithm. Uh, some advantages of coordinate descent are you don't need to specify a learning rate or step size. Uh, because you're, what you're doing is you're, you're just analytically computing the uh, optimal uh, parameter for each coordinate because each coordinate, the optimization problem, uh, is usually a convex problem. Uh, and then if coordinate descent can be used for a model, it tends to be often equivalent to the state of the art. Uh, however, the problem is that because it is divided across parameters rather than data samples, if you have a very large number of data samples, the time for each iteration also uh, increases and you might get very long iterations that are measured in minutes or hours. Okay, so in the lasso case, uh, instead of doing a gradient step across all, uh, taking the first derivative across all parameters, we're going to just uh, basically analytically solve for this. So the way we'll do it is via setting the subgradient of uh, the uh, equation here to zero. And then we can just derive directly update rule for each, uh, for one coordinate at a time, which looks like this. 
Um, and then we can, this is for a updating a single coordinate. It turns out that you can update a set of coordinates at the same time and solve for that analytically uh, by setting them to, to zero. And then what we're going to do is that for every coordinate or every group of coordinates, we're just going to go with them one at a time in round robin fashion, updating to the optima, moving to the next group, updating to the optima, and so forth. Um, now let's talk a little bit about how to do this in parallel and at scale. Uh, one of the first algorithms, uh, which was called parallel coordinate descent, uh, specifically uh, the shotgun algorithm, which was also developed at CMU, is we're going to, instead of picking all the parameters in sequence, let's say I have you know, one million parameters and I go from one to one million in order, I'm going to have every parallel worker uh, kind of like the hog wild uh, sparse stochastic gradient descent algorithm earlier, I'm going to choose a set of parameters to update at random. I'm just going to update them in parallel and iterate until uh, convergence. So this is kind of like the hog wild equivalent for CD coordinate descent rather than SGD. Now, what are the guarantees for this algorithm? When the features are nearly independent, uh, you'll find that shotgun uh, coordinate descent actually has really good scaling. It scales almost linearly. Uh, in fact, the 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 way the, the, the bound here is that you can compute a quantity called rho, which is the spectral radius of uh, A transpose A. A is actually the, the data matrix, which is, uh, say, the num every row is a sample, every column is a, is a feature, feature value. And then you can scale linearly up to this formula here. Uh, and for, because what happens is that when the data, the features in each uh, column of the data matrix, if they are truly perfectly uncorrelated with each other, row turns out to be one, and if the features are exactly correlated, how do you get that? Let's say I have a set data set with only one feature, and I duplicate that uh, one million times. Then what you have is a data set where every feature is perfectly correlated, and then row equals D. And then you can see by plugging in row equals D into this formula that you actually get no parallelism. Uh, D over 2D is basically less than one, so you cannot scale beyond one worker for this algorithm to exactly correlate it. Okay, so, so why does this happen? Why is correlation so important? Uh, so this is one of the major uh, takeaways from this lecture. So this is something to focus on. When the features are uncorrelated, what happens when we're taking coordinate descent steps? You can see that in an uncorrelated case, this is kind of like this uh, balanced circle here. When I'm trying to converge to an optimum, I'm going to take a step in one coordinate, like x sub i, or another step x sub j. And you can see that if I take these steps towards the optimum, I'm going to have a pretty, uh, pretty stable convergence. But if the features are correlated, you have this uh, ellipse over here. And then what happens is that when they're correlated, the steps in each axis or each uh, coordinate become this kind, kind of much larger. And that's because of the correlation between the data. When you end up taking larger steps, what happens is like you have a tendency to overshoot the optima or it's very difficult to converge precisely onto the optimum because remember that coordinate descent doesn't have step sizes to control the learning rate. So when you overshoot, it's very difficult and it's very unstable to converge to the optimum over here. Okay, so uh, an improvement to the Shotman algorithm, uh, which was developed a little later, is called block greedy coordinate descent, where, um, where the, the, the trick here is rather than selecting the coordinates at random, we're going to actually do a little bit of pre-partitioning of the data matrix. Uh, so for example, if I have a matrix of 1 million, uh, that's say 1 million samples by 1 million parameters, I could maybe divide it into 10 blocks, right? I'm gonna have 10 different blocks of parameters uh, and each of the blocks of parameters uh, is uh, say uh, 1 million samples times only 100,000 parameters. Then uh, what happens is that uh, when, when we're doing the parallel uh, coordinate descent, we're going to select, say, these 10 blocks. I'm going to give them to 10 different workers, and every worker just selects uh, the coordinates within each block to optimize. And this guarantees that the coordinates never collide. So uh, why is this important? Uh, it, it turns out that um, when you are partitioning the parameters into, uh, and, and uh, in fact, this actually depends on what kind of partitioning algorithm uh, you use. So typically the partitioning algorithm tries to select parameters that are uncorrelated. It's kind of like pre-processing the data to make sure I divide it into blocks of uncorrelated parameters. And if you have done this well, then during the coordinate descent itself, 
there is a low correlation between parameters being worked on each worker, respect to each other, and that improves the uh, correlation according to this uh, intuition described here. Okay. And then a further extension, uh, so the disadvantage of block reading quarter descent, as you can imagine, is that it requires you to pre-process the data set. Uh, it turns out that if the data set is very large, let's say we're talking a million samples times a million parameters, uh, then what happens is that um, just try to figure out whether one parameter is correlated with another. Uh, you know, intuitively calculating the, that intuitively boils down to calculating the covariance matrix of this one million times one million matrix, uh, which is itself a cubic operation. So ironically, the, the pre-processing for this algorithm can actually be more expensive than the corner descent itself. So that's actually not very practical for very large data sets. So a way to improve upon that, and this is the third uh, quarter percent algorithm I'll present, uh, is something called a, uh, it's a system called a structure-aware dynamic scheduler, where rather than pre-computing a partition of different uh, parameters, we're going to dynamically on the fly decide uh, which parameters are going to be given to each worker. So it's not going to be a random assignment. It's not going to be a pre-partition assignment. We're going to do it dynamically on the fly. And what happens, why is this advantageous? Because I don't actually need to check the full co covariance matrix of the 1 million parameters. If I have only 10 workers, I just need to pick 10 coordinates and I need to just check, are these 10 coordinates independent of each other? And that's uh, computing a covariance matrix on only 10 parameters, which is much smaller. Uh, and it happens that some of them are correlated. I can just sample a new batch again. So this is actually a more practical algorithm because it avoids the cubic complexity of figuring out if uh, parameters are correlated or not. And then you can also do other optimizations uh, such as priority-based updates where I'm going to even record down for every coordinate how much it's been contributing to the overall objective function and I'm going to prioritize those that decrease the objective function faster. So this is a system we'll talk a little bit about when we get to the systems part of the lecture. But I just want, for now, what you need to know is that there are uh, pretty interesting ways to improve upon quarter descent if you do some uh, careful systems design. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this slide because it's what I said earlier. Uh, and then what's really cool about these uh, priority-based schedulers is that whereas a standard quarter descent exhibits this uh, dotted line convergence curve, you can actually get a much uh, more interestingly shaped and sharper convergence curve if you are using this uh, dependency checking and priority-based scheduling on the fly. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that uh, naive random quarter descent is leaving a lot of potential uh, uh, convergence uh, speed on the table, and this is where the benefit of using a system such as Strats comes in. Okay. All right. Pausing here. Uh, Okay, I, I just saw a question. So, uh, Arnav, you ask, uh, how do the updates to the actual parameters happen after some changes happen in each worker? So, the, the answer for quarter descent and stochastic gradient descent is that let's go back to the uh, let's go back to the update equation. So, when you derive this update rule, uh, two things. This what will happen is that every worker will first update their local copy of the parameters on every machine, and then after you've done a local update you now need to synchronize the updates with each other. So it's like, I did some work on my own and I now need to tell everyone what work I did. So uh, what I didn't mention is that these coordinate descent programs, you can synchronize the updates to the actual global parameter via a key value store or parameter server, or uh, it could be a peer-to-peer -peer update. Everybody just tells everybody else what I've updated. Uh, so these are the two ways in which you can update the parameters. Uh, but uh, and so basically, this, this is generally a pretty simple step, uh, except where, uh, say, more advanced uh, consistency models, uh, such as the uh, bounded asynchronous parallel scheme I just described are involved, or say even the asynchronous scheme where parameters don't wait, uh, sorry, workers don't wait for each other to update. They just send updates to each other as and when they're completed. So, so yes, the, the changes to each worker will depend on whether you're doing it in a bound synchronous parallel manner, on asynchronous manner, or a bounded asynchronous manner, which I'll kind of talk about in the last part of the lecture. Okay, did that answer your question? Perfect, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so 
I'm uh, in the interest of time, uh, this section on advanced optimization techniques, I'm going to go uh, in uh, maybe a more high level overview here, both because it's mathematically more complex, but also to save enough time for the next part of the lecture. Uh, these advanced optimization techniques, uh, kind of the question we want to ask is what uh, we know, for those of you that uh, have taken the optimization course or work in optimization yourself, you'll know that uh, a stochastic gradient descent uh, and coordinate descent are basically some of the simplest algorithms you can use. And then there's different algorithms that have been developed with concepts such as uh, momentum, smoothing, uh, proximal updates uh, that can be used to uh, dramatically improve the convergence rate. That's to say, how much progress towards the objective you make every iteration. And then the interesting question is, how can I turn some of these algorithms into parallel or, or scalable equivalents? Um, and what we'll see is that because these techniques are more advanced, it requires us to break down the different steps uh, different steps on a single uh, machine implementation into different um, say parallel or non-parallel steps in a, in a multi-machine or multi-CPU or multi-GPU uh, implementation. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to just briefly skip over this, but uh, I want to introduce the proximal gradient algorithm, uh, which can be applied to, for example, the lasso regression problem or any type of regularized uh, problem where you have a data function, a loss function f on the data, and then a some kind of regularizer, usually non-differentiable g. Um, the intuition behind proximal gradient is that uh, it's an extension of the projected gradient algorithm. The projected gradient algorithm first covers up g. You don't look at g, you just look at f, you take a gradient step, and then you G is, uh, in the projection gradient case, basically encoding a constraint. It's like, say, I can only be within this uh, square between minus 1 to 1 on every axis. And then I'm going to project the, the gradient step I took so that it's back inside the square. And proximal gradient is simply an extension of that, but the function G doesn't have to be encode a constraint. It can encode things like an L1 penalty or an L2 penalty, for instance. So, um, the proximal gradient algorithm, um, I won't go into detail on this slide, basically relies on uh, kind of like, you know, when we do matrix algebra, we have matrix cheat sheets that tell us, okay, how do I uh, uh, okay, do take a differential of, uh, the, of a particular matrix, for instance, or second derivative to the hashed of a matrix. Uh, similarly, the, the way most people use proximal gradient is that people have developed uh, basically the form of the projected function for the regularizer G. And so you usually look up, uh, say, one of these common forms, just like when you're doing uh, differentiation, right? And then you just, all you have to do is to apply, after you take a gradient step, apply this function, this P, to the, grade, to the uh, parameters, and that will perform the proximal gradient. And the nice part is that if you have multiple uh, uh, regularization functions like G1, G2, then you, can, you only have to uh, know how to do each of the, proximal forms individually, and then you can just apply them in sequence. In fact, the order doesn't even matter. They all have the same guarantee. Okay, so some of the, uh, very briefly, some of the improvements that were made to the original proximal gradient algorithm include adding a momentum term. You can think of momentum as basically a way to kind of add like some stickiness to the trajectory. Uh, this, uh, but this stickiness, it turns out, can actually accelerate the uh, convergence towards an optimum. Uh, and then, now let's talk uh, very briefly about how you would parallelize such an algorithm. Rem recall from the stochastic gradient step that uh, if you look at the general strategy, step one, you see that it's basically computing some gradient, uh, which is the red box on every worker. And then you're going to upgrade, update all the gradients on the uh, server, let's say using the key value store. So that part is equivalent to standard stochastic gradient descent. Then how do you do the proximal gradient part? Well, it's actually pretty simple. You have the servers perform the proximal operator, right? So again, workers compute the, the different uh, gradient estimates. They're aggregated at the server, and then the server performs the proximal operator. The server can also perform the momentum uh, operation, and then you send the parameters back to workers and repeat. So this is what I meant when I said that there are some operations that can be parallelized, such as the gradient computation, but the aggregation and proximal, uh, the proximal operator momentum are done at the central server. 
Okay, so uh, obviously the pros and cons of this approach are that if you have a really large number of parameters, uh, let's say billions, the um, proximal operation and momentum uh, operation could take a while to, to compute, uh, especially because not all proximal operators are linear computation time. Some of them may be more than linear. So generally, you would only apply such a technique if the number of parameters is fairly small. But the good news is that it doesn't matter how many data samples you have because the proximal operator momentum functions don't depend, as you can see, on the number of samples. They only depend on the size of the parameters. Okay. Uh, another improvement to proximal uh, gradient was to add a smoothing function, which is useful for um, problems that are, well, they're kind of like convex, like lasso regression, but because, of the, uh, because they're not smooth, um, sometimes the convergence rate uh, is, not, uh, is, is not ideal. And so what happens is that if you add a, if you replace the function f with what we call this envelope function, which is basically the original function f plus uh, a quadratic function around it, this has the effect uh, of smoothing out the, um, the uh, kind of the sharp points of the function. And it turns out that this improves a convergence rate. Uh, and the interesting part about this smoothing is that instead of taking a grade, it turns out that doing this, optimizing this envelope function is actually equivalent to applying the uh, proximal uh, map. Remember, recall that we're going to look up a cheat sheet for each uh, proximal function uh, for F itself. Uh, so if you, if you look at the math hard enough, you'll understand why. I won't go into details. But what this results in is a very interesting uh, algorithm um, where you... Uh, instead of doing a gradient step, followed by, say, a number of proximal maps, you're just doing a number of proximal maps in sequence. Okay, um, okay so in fact, that's shown in this box here. Uh, this, this is basically the gradient update for this envelope function, which, as I've mentioned, can be completely replaced with the proximal update on function f, and then you apply the proximal update of function g, which is the regularizer. So this is kind of interesting because how would you parallelize uh, this if there's no gradient step and it's just a bunch of proximal operations, right? Um, well, th there's no easy answer for this, uh, as you can imagine, right? If there is a way to parallel compute the proximal function, then, which is going to depend on a case-by-case -case basis, it really depends on what the form of uh, P sub F is. Uh, then you're, you should be able to uh, split that work over different workers, and then you aggregate on servers and perform the proximal function on the regularizer G, which is usually difficult to parallelize. So um, this is an area that I would say is an open area of research. It's not clear whether you can do this for, it, it really depends on whether the function F can be parallelized, uh, whether its proximal map can be parallelized or not. Okay. So that was just kind of a brief uh, touch base on the different types of uh, proximal uh, and momentum algorithms that exist and showing that there's some, sometimes it's a good way to parallelize and sometimes it's an open research area. Okay, moving on to the, the, the next part, I'm going to talk about optimization and MCMC algorithms, uh, which is the other major category of uh, parallel algorithms. I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, algorithms, which is the other major category. Uh, and then here we're going to talk about auxiliary variable methods, embarrassingly parallel MCMC, and parallel Gibbs sampling. Okay. So, recall that earlier we introduced uh, the, the topic model as one of the potential running examples. Uh, to recall them, there are two major matrices in this topic model, uh, 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 model, which is a document topic matrix that we call delta uh, and a topic word matrix, which we call uh, B. Uh, basically, the, 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 document, uh, the document topic matrix is going to be if there's usually a lot of uh, rows because we might have, say, a million to a billion documents, the number of topics is usually between like 1,000 to 1 million. Uh, similarly, the topic word matrix will have between 1,000 to 1 million rows and the number of words. Uh, if you uh, recall from the topic model lecture earlier in the syllabus, uh, the words here are basically just the different unique words that's found in the corpus, such as, uh, say, finance, health, uh, science, for example. Uh, one of the most efficient ways of doing uh, learning uh, the parameters for a topic model is to 
perform Markov chain Monte Carlo inference, where you basically do sample the variables uh, of each part of the model in sequence, and then go between the different parameters uh, until you've done a full cycle, and then you repeat that until convergence. The other way to do it is to turn it into an optimization problem using variational inference, where you basically take a, uh, a simpler distribution and try to fit it to the more complex and intractable uh, distribution of the original topic model. So um, there are some, uh, some techniques that, uh, with, uh, that can be applied to speed up the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. Without going into too much detail, you just need to know that one technique is called what we call an alias uh, table, which is um, rather than drawing from, uh, rather than trying to sample over a probability distribution, which means you have to generate a number between zero and one, and then say, oh, does it fall between zero to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.75 to one? I'm actually just going to say, I'm going to have all the potential samples values out there, which is uh, in this distribution, it's two of value one, one of value two, one of value three. So you can see that this table here is actually representing the same probability distribution here. I'm going to take this table and I'm just going to pick a number be integer between one to size of the table at random. This is a, a kind of a computational trick because it turns out that computers are very good at generating random integers, but it's actually harder for them to generate uh, and then after you generate a random integer, you just do a random access. Like if I generate uh, index three, then I'm going to look up the third index of this table, which is very cheap. Whereas if I were to sample from a probability distribution, that's at least uh, uh, log, log n time, n is the size of the distribution, the table. So that's just a little trick that people use to speed up MCMC. Uh, the other trick that you can use is that you can actually break up the, um, uh, complex distributions such as a posterior into a prior and uh, the uh, evidence uh, part of the uh, of the posterior and then you don't actually have to sample this entire posterior at once you could make a sample for the prior and then use it uh, use metropolis hastings to accept or reject that sample and then you can move on to the next one and accept or reject. So you're basically using the flexibility of metropolis case things to be able to sample from very simple distributions like the prior evidence. Uh, and then the cost that you pay is that you now have to do an accept reject step. So, but it turns out that uh, if you, for topic models, by breaking it up this way, the accept reject rates turn out to be pretty high and the computational cost of the evidence and prior is low. So on balance, it turns out to be more effective than sampling directly from the posterior, especially because it turns out it's very easy to sample the prior and evidence given the alias table technique. Okay. Uh, so those are some of the preliminaries and tricks that people use in Marco Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, let's talk about the different MCMC methods. So the most primitive MCMC method, uh, and the one that's existed for a very long time now, is simply to, just like a uh, naive parallel SGD, I'm just going to run several uh, workers independently, let them produce their Monte, uh, Marco chain Monte Carlo samples, and then I'm just going to convert, take an average of consensus between the different chains. The only problem is that if the chains haven't converged or are very slow to converge, then you're not going to be able, you can see that the chains will not overlap with each other. They will not form a very uh, well-balanced distribution. So that's uh, just it's like intuitively the same flaw as uh, the parallel SGD. If you only talk once to each other, you're not going to get a very good consensus result. Okay, the other method that's classically used is sequential importance sampling, uh, which um, I'm not going to go deep into the mathematical details, but what you need to know is that it's basically taking a uh, take an equation and you want to expand it as a telescoping sum, and then you're just going to draw uh, in this sorry, telescoping product, and then for each element of the product, you're going to draw samples uh, from, from it, basically. Uh, you're going to draw, say, the, let's say I have uh, 10 elements in this product, I equals 1 to 10. I'm going to draw the first element, then I'm going to draw a second element, condition in the first, the third element, condition in the first and second, and so on and so forth, uh, which is really basically a, uh, a Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And it turns out that this is, this is a very classical method used to uh, basically break up a complex probability distribution into simpler elements, which are easier to sample from. Uh, but there are some drawbacks to this method that the longer your telescoping product, the more variance and more instability you get in the algorithm. Okay. Uh, 
So those are some of the classical solutions to, to uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo parallelization. The modern solutions that have been developed, say, in the last 10 years or so, are one way is to rewrite the model by adding in new auxiliary variables. So, uh, for example, um, if you were to look at uh, uh, topic models, the classic topic model sampler uses a uh, Dirichlet, uh, uh, uses, uh, uh, so what we call the compound Dirichlet multinomial distribution, right? So, they, but uh, the compound Dirichlet multinomial distribution, if you've heard of it, basically comes from two things a Dirichlet distribution and a multinomial distribution. So, in a similar fashion, it turns out that for Bayesian non-parametric models like the Dirichlet process, it's possible to break up their, uh, the model, which is the right side, into a more, uh, kind of a more uh, parted, it's, it's a, the same model, but it has more variables because it makes explicit uh, more steps in the sampling process. It, um, and why would you ever want to do this? Why would you ever want to make the model more complicated? Um, it turns out that it's the same intuition as actually the sequential important sampling. Uh, if you break up a complex probability distribution into multiple smaller probability distributions, you may find that each one of them is actually easier to sample from than the full distribution. Right? So it's really a way to uh, kind of sacrifice some statistical efficiency in order to gain more computational efficiency, which is a recurring trade-off that occurs in designing scalable ML algorithms. Right. Um, essentially, this is, uh, this is just some proof that it's equivalent. And uh, the parallel algorithm turns out that if you look at this formulation, instead of having one big Dirichlet process, we actually now have P, capital P Dirichlet processes. And it turns out that we can assign each Dirichlet process to one of P workers. And then you can just have all of them sample the Dirichlet processes. And then there's a synchronization step where you need to um, you need to uh, synchronize the information for the sake of the overall uh, Dirichlet process. Uh, and then basically you uh, need to alternate between sampling on each of the P Dirichlet processes versus the uh, global process itself. Uh, so the details I'm not gonna go too deep into, but suffice to say that by breaking it up this way, you've enabled parallelization to occur, which allows you to trade off statistical efficiency for getting more parallel computation. Um, another way uh, to handle this is uh, a technique that's called embarrassingly parallel MCMC. And just like the previous techniques, it's all about designing a new set of distributions that if you sample in a certain way, will reproduce the original distribution. And the idea behind embarrassingly parallel MCMC is that it's a really sophisticated way of doing, say, sequential importance sampling, but without the drawback that you have this exponentially exploding uh, variance. So once again, we're going to basically uh, um, we, we're going to basically define a full posterior distribution, and we're going to define these sub posteriors, which have this particular equation form that's related to the full posterior. Briefly, a sub posterior is basically the posterior distribution on a subset of data, but not exactly the same. You can see there's actually a prior that's been uh, downweighted by one of them. Um, then um, the details of this algorithm are fairly mathematically intense, so I won't go into it. But the high-level intuition is that now that you've constructed these special sub-posteriors, you can draw the samples independently in parallel, and then there's a particular way to combine them via non-parametric estimation, uh, which requires you to solve basically, for example, a kernel density estimate problem. Um, so although this is a mathematically complex step, the idea is that we are able to for each of the sub-posteriors of each machine, combine them all in a single, uh, maybe expensive step at the end, and then just recover and estimate the full posterior. And it turns out that compared to, uh, uh, say, some naive baseline, such as doing naive averaging of sub-posteriors instead of doing the kernel density, density um, estimate, uh, you tend to get uh, better convergence. So this is, uh, of course, of interest of those to you who um, are looking to mark, mark chain Monte Carlo algorithms. Um, the last solution, which is parallel GIMP sampling, uh, this is actually kind of the simplest of the three, um, and it's also the one that's been applied very successfully to topic models and other similarly structured latent variable models. Um, the idea is that if you are using the, uh, uh, based on the idea called the compound Dirichlet multinomial distribution, 
which fuses the Dirichlet and multinomial distributions in the GIP, in the topic model together, you can derive something that's called a collapsed uh, GIP sampler. Um, I won't have time to go into the mathematical uh, details, but I, I, I believe that in this lecture series, you must have covered this in an earlier lecture. So what I'll do is instead, I'll talk about the properties of collapsed GIP sampling and what are challenges in trying to parallelize it. So the good news is that this is a really simple equation. It just requires you to look up some tables, delta uh, and beta, and then do some calculations, and it's very easy to implement this. Um, it also has great theoretical properties because due to the compound Dirichlet multinomial distribution, we've basically round Blackwell lies. We've reduced the number of variables we need to sample by integrating out one of the variables. So that guarantees that CGS has a lower variance and better stability than naive give sampling. And it's pretty robust. The parameters are sparse, the updates are sparse. It's, a, it's one of actually the success stories of the last 10 years of how to parallelize. Uh, the thing about staleness is that, as we showed a little earlier with parallel SGD and the convergence equations, you want to get the staleness as low as possible. You want to be as up to date as possible. And one way to do that is to enable uh, asynchronous communication, where in asynchronous communication, instead of these uh, broadcast and commit steps being uh, kind of being done in, in well disciplined phases, we're just going to have, as the sampling happens, we're going to broadcast every little change back. So this is like the equivalent of uh, when you're working with a version control system, committing every line of code change you have uh, every, every, literally every like minute. So it kind of, uh, it kind of helps, uh, but it turns out there's a better solution, which is to smartly partition up the uh, dot topic and word topic matrices in a way such they don't overlap. So this is the same intuition as the Hogwild algorithm. You want to, the, the way to, to handle the, the matrices becoming stale and out of sync with each other is just to make sure that the changes don't affect different workers. So it turns out that you can partition the workers in such a way that uh, different workers or different document partitions only touch certain subsets of the word topic matrix. And that actually can be done as a graph partitioning algorithm. Uh, so that in every step when you sample, hey, you don't have to, um, you find that one worker can take a subset of the document and words and then sample that safely without affecting the values that another worker depends on. Okay. So it's actually, this is actually a data and model parallel strategy together. And it turns out that you can use asynchronous communication safely because after all, they don't overlap. Same intuition as a hog one. The drawback, of course, is that you need to convert the problem into a graph and um, you can get very uneven and unbalanced graphs. So it turns out there are better ways to partition. And in fact, the smarter way to partition this model rather than doing a graph cut is these are matrices. And it turns out that there's something called a non-overlapping matrix partition. It's an idea that's been used for many years now, where see these gray blocks over here. If I have a square matrix and I take these three gray blocks, they don't overlap. And then if I move on to this new set of gray blocks, again, they don't overlap. By overlap, I mean they don't overlap with rows or columns. And then you can touch the next set of gray blocks, which again, don't overlap. And what you can see is that if you touch all nine of these gray blocks, you've covered the whole matrix. So that's the partitioning intuition behind uh, light LDA, which is something that uh, Eric and I worked on a couple of years ago, where if I, if I schedule the updates on the doc and word topic matrix according to these gray blocks, I'm always guaranteed to never collide on parameters. I'm always guaranteed to be able to sample each of the uh, sample within each of these blocks safely. Um, so uh, without going to too much detail, uh, you can kind of view this on your own time. You basically do, you read the, the documents of this, you put them to workers, you load just the part of the pig matrix that you need, that's the word topic matrix. And then you do the sample, uh, you write back to disk and the key value store. And you just do that for every worker. It's a, it's a more complex implementation, but by being very smart about the partitioning, it has great statistical properties and it converges very quickly. Um, and doesn't have the unbalanced graph partitioning problem that the graph lab style uh, problem uh, uh, way of doing it produces. Um, I'm not going to go into details about the uh, error. That technically, this model parallel LDA, like LDA, still isn't ergodic. There's actually a small amount of error, but it turns out that in practice, it's very small. That's a big takeaway. Okay, so 
in summary, we've talked about optimization and MCMC algorithms uh, and the different considerations. And now we're going to, uh, and I know we're out of time here. So uh, I will just say this uh, for the TAs and people who are recording, you're welcome to stop whenever uh, you need to. Uh, otherwise, I will just keep going for uh, as long as, as I have. Uh, does that sound good? All right then, uh, as I said, uh, feel free to leave when the, when the lecture is over, uh, but I will just uh, keep continuing for the sake of completing the lecture. So this distributed system for ML, uh, and this will go quite a bit faster because we actually introduced many of the concepts such as sparsity, such as scheduling, such as prioritization, such as dependencies. Uh, in the first half of the lecture, you'll see all of these concepts recur again in this second part where we're talking about how these systems are built. The idea is that in these parallel ML algorithms, we are exploiting algorithmic and mathematical properties uh, of the training or the learning part or the inference part to make efficient distributed ML algorithms. And the cool part is that when you need to do the inferential part, the prediction part, uh, it turns out that that's usually embarrassingly parallel. Once you have a trained model, you can duplicate it across every machine and just let every machine answer queries as it comes in. Now, in this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about what are the systems properties of real-world machines. So, so we've, we've gone through the lecture so far, assuming that uh, machines are fast, machines are perfect, machines do exactly what we tell them to do. Uh, it turns out that those assumptions are only partially true. There are some uh, elements of real-world computing systems. Like, for example, have you ever tried to launch a big parallel ML job on AWS? You may have noticed that sometimes it goes faster and sometimes it goes slower and for reasons you can't understand why. Well, the answer is that if you're using some of the cheaper AWS instances, what happens is AWS is actually putting multiple virtual machines onto a single machine. So depending on what the other users' workloads, which you cannot see, are doing or what they're sending over a network, you may get more or less performance at a time. So the fact is we all have to share computing resources. We share our lab clusters, we share AWS with the other AWS users. And knowing about these properties is actually turns out to be essential for making really large scale implementations of ML. All right, so as I was hinting at, there's no ideal distributed system. Uh, there's two problems. One is that networks are actually really slow compared to CPU and GPU memory accesses. Uh, CPU and GPU memory accessors are generally measured in the nanoseconds, uh, whereas um, access over a network tends to be measured in the microseconds if you're on a local area network. If you're measure, doing this over the internet, it's going to be measured in the milliseconds. So uh, what was that saying? It's basically saying that networks are a thousand times or more slower than CPU and GPU memory access. So it's the difference between having a Zoom video and, uh, I don't know, sending, sending a letter that takes a year to arrive, basically. Uh, the other thing that I hinted to earlier is that identical machines rarely perform equally because there's always other operating system tasks running on the machine, like background jobs, backup, virus scan, network firewall, or worse, there's actually other users executing programs on the same machine, like different virtual machines. Okay, so how do we, uh, the fact is these aspects, as we will show, well, greatly impact the effectiveness of different parallel ML implementations in different ways. Um, and the, the point is that what, if you're using bulk synchronous parallel style updates where you're waiting for all machines to talk to each other, these two properties, the, the slow communication and unequal performance, mean that in practice, you always end up waiting for the slowest machine. It's the, what we call the curse of the slowest worker, in, uh, say, which is well known since the era of uh, Hadoop. When you have um, different machines performing at different speed, you are all, even if you partition the data perfectly balanced, someone's going to be slow and that's going to slow down your whole program, right? It's like saying someone's always late for a meeting. Uh, and the other thing is that even if an algorithm is completely sound from a theoretical perspective and has attractive properties, it may consume too much bandwidth for a local area network. Remember that a deep learning model with one billion parameters, such as some of the recent language models, that's four billion bytes, that's four gigabytes that you need to transfer over a network every time you sync. Turns out this is very expensive. And then there's also latency, like how many milliseconds does it take to get uh, the, the data across the network? And then, okay, if you partition the data and model, you need to make sure it fits in the memory or local storage. Uh, and you know that's also gonna affect what you send over the network. 
And even the scheduling affects the convergence rate and again, the amount of communication you have to do. So there's actually all these aspects that, that are relevant because the machines are not perfect and we have to basically design around them. So we call the intuition that you know, ML iterative convergent algorithms are generally you take a pass, full pass over the data for every sample you perform an update and then you commit those updates to model parameters, right? Um, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, if you've ever used, uh, now Hadoop is probably not really used by anyone anymore these days, but it serves as a good reference case to understand how people were thinking about the evolution of parallel ML systems. When Hadoop was designed, it wasn't actually designed for ML algorithms. It was designed for uh, these big data processing tasks that were able to be completed in a single iteration of map and reduce. So Hadoop was designed with this uh, idea that I'm going to perform the map in memory, then I'm going to uh, reduce, and then I'm going to write the reduced results back to the distributed file system. So it, this is a very slow step. And when people first tried to apply Hadoop to machine learning algorithms, they found out that, shockingly, the machine learning algorithms on Hadoop on, say, 100 machines was actually slower than running a well-optimized implementation on a single machine. So it was actually a classic uh, problem that the systems community has known for a long time. Just because you paralyze an algorithm doesn't mean it's going to be faster. You can actually get negative scalability. Two machines are slower than one if you're not careful. And the reason for that in Hadoop, this is the culprit here. The bottleneck is that when you do ML in Hadoop, you need to do this map reduce, write to disk, map reduce, write to disk for every iteration. Writing to disk, especially over a distributed file system, is extremely slow, especially if you have a very large model. It can take minutes to write out the model to disk, but it can only take seconds to do the map and reduce. So if you're taking minutes to talk to the file system, you've basically become 100 times slower than a single machine algorithm. So that emphasizes why good parallel strategy is important. You really want to reduce the time taken by the barrier as much as possible because um, that's basically the concept of compute time versus waiting time. Waiting time is talking over the network, writing to disk, doing everything except the machine learning uh, update function, uh, which is you know, this parallel update over here. Data parallelism, as a recap, just graphically to show you, you divide data over every machine, you synchronize, you compute updates, and you synchronize to the uh, global parameter store. Model parallelism is kind of the counterpart to that. Every machine takes a look at all the data, but computes only different subsets of the model, which don't even have to be uh, the same structure like in graph lab. Uh, and we will see that good, actually, ML systems uh, generally fall into one of these two categories, data parallelism or model parallelism. Uh, and it's also possible, in fact, necessary for some of the largest problems to combine both. In fact, what you will see in um, many of the most sophisticated uh, deep learning implementations today, uh, but, or even in the topic model example I gave earlier, is that you want to not only partition the data over different workers, you want to partition, say, the different architectural components, different layers of the model onto different machines uh, in order to uh, design the get around many of the systems limitations that real-world systems uh, kind of impose. So that's kind of graphically illustrated like this. So how difficult is it in general to do data and model parallelism? We saw a lot of examples in the first part of the lecture, and it turns out that it really boils down to a couple of things. Data parallelism is okay when data is IID, independent, identically distributed. This is basically the basic assumption for the vast majority of ML models. Of course, there are models where the data is not assumed to be such, but those are a much rarer case that we will not discuss here. Um, and the idea is that when you have IID data, uh, you're able to take basically estimates like stochastic gradient, est gradient descent, estimates of the uh, gradient or other um, algorithm quantities that turn out to be very close to serial execution. The model parallelism is very different. You can't naively do this. You can't just naively chop up the parameters and, and give them to different machines. Uh, you have to, because it is not equivalent, it's not, not even close to the serial execution of the ML algorithm, you need to actually design a schedule around it to uh, restore as much of the performance as possible. We saw earlier that uh, shotgun quarter descent, for instance, if you don't do it carefully and you do it on data that's highly correlated, you won't get any parallelism speed up. So let's recap some of the intrinsic properties of ML programs. 
we talked about error tolerance right at the beginning of the lecture. If I have some error in the ML algorithm's trajectory, it's usually able to recover because it's always heading towards an uh, optimum. There are structural dependencies, uh, which may also be static, which can also be dynamic, which are changing correlations between model parameters, which are uh, critical to efficient parallelization. So basically, the, what this is saying is that the schedule, how you split parameters to different workers, uh, in what order you do them, the optimal schedule actually changes over time. And third property is that there's actually non uniform convergence. It turns out that parameters can converge in very different number of steps. Uh, this is actually the principle behind, um, say, uh, why, um, why, why, for example, it's part of the intuition behind why techniques such as dropout in deep learning work. It's also part of the reason uh, why uh, certain types of uh, compression and techniques in, uh, that are used in the deep learning community uh, also are effective. Because since parameters can converge in different number of steps, you can actually drop all the parameters that have a low amount of change and just focus on the ones that change the most. Uh, this is actually an intuition that's uh, been well studied for many years, even before its application in deep learning. Okay. Now, uh, the challenges in data parallelism are that existing ways are either safe or slow or fast and uh, what I call fast and risky. So there's bounce synchronous parallel, which is you have this, it's like, like Hadoop and Spark where you have every worker do some competition, you wait for all of them to complete, you exchange results, you do that. Uh, the problem with that is that if you have a slow worker, like say someone else is doing something on the machine, the whole thing will slow down. Uh, then you have asynchronous, which is uh, you're allowing every worker to go at its own speed, but asynchronous doesn't make the slow worker problem go away. So let's say you have one machine that uh, has a problem. And in fact, this is a true story. You can have, a machine that all of a sudden for systems like Hadoop become very slow and it turns out the reason is that the hard drive is vibrating or the hard drive is overheated because in a data center different parts of the data center are cooled differently you know you can't cool every machine equivalently so depending on the heat conditions and vibration conditions like due to a fan spinning uh, you may have a vibrating hard drive and that vibrating hard drive can actually greatly slow down the read and write uh, performance from hard drive um, that in turn causes the machine to become very slow. And when that happens, you get a situation where many workers are doing work, but one worker is so far behind that all of the work it does is actually counterproductive because it's basically operating on a model version that is so old that uh, anything it updates on is actually completely, uh, uh, it's basically conflicting with everything else that's being done. So the way to solve this is actually to uh, introduce uh, the idea of partial synchro synchrony, which is you don't want to go to the extremes of BSP and ASIC. You do need to synchronize. You do need to have some discipline about when you synchronize, but you need to also give some flexibility to deal with the slow worker problem. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the straggler tolerance as well. Slow threads, you need to also give create a system such that the slow threads will naturally catch up to the fast ones because otherwise you're always going to have a problem. Um, so, earlier we talked about this uh, idea of bounded asynchronous parallel, so we're going to revisit it here, and we're going to talk about some of its systems properties here. So, in this stale synchronous parallel, uh, uh, a bounded asynchronous parallel model, recall that you're going to allow the different workers to be up to, say, uh, x iterations apart. Here, x is 3. So, you can go in your own space, own speed, own pace, up until a limit, there's basically a central machine or one of the machines is watching all of the different uh, uh, workers and it's stopping the workers that are going really fast. It's going to make them wait until the slower ones catch up. So uh, the, in addition to preserving a sort of like partial bulk synchronous parallel guarantee that avoids some of the worst case results from asynchronous execution, um, there's an interesting also uh, property that uh, because updates are aggregated at the central server, the slower workers, when they finally get a chance to pull the update, they are actually pulling all the updates from all the other workers at one go. So it's kind of, it's like kind of saying that, hey, I received all my Amazon packages today rather than one every day. Then I only have to make one trip down to my, uh, to my mailbox to pick it up. Because of that aggregation, it actually reduces the communication load for the slow worker 
giving it a chance to catch up. So it actually has this nice self-balancing of self-healing property. Uh, and in terms of convergence results, um, we saw some results earlier, and I think the big intuition here is that as you want to control the amount of staleness, you you have uh, which is the the gap between the fastest and slowest worker. If uh, bulk synchronous, uh, sorry, stale synchronous parallel imposes an uh, upper limit on staleness, which is you know three. about pushing it as soon as there's available bandwidth, what you do is that you decrease uh, not the maximum staleness, but the average staleness, the average gap between the fastest and slowest worker. And then that in turn actually results uh, in, uh, so instead of having a uniform distribution of a staleness, you have this um, uh, distribution that's centered closer to zero. And that actually in turn, based on the theorems that I showed in the first part of the lecture, by reducing the amount of staleness, you're reducing the amount of variance in the parameter estimate. You're also allowing that convergence to become exponentially faster. Okay, so these are just some graphs showing that uh, still synchronous parallel is actually better than bulk synchronous parallel or asynchronous parallel, being a best of both worlds kind of system. Uh, and now let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges in model parallelism. We're gonna to switch topics here. Um, so the, I talked a little bit about uh, how different parameters are correlated in the first part of the lecture. Now I'm going to um, explain what that really means. So when you do uh, a quarter percent update in Lasso, it has this form here. You're basically computing this, uh, basically some inner products, multiplying them by some, basically you're computing the inner product of the, uh, of the data with the labels and then subtracting it with the, uh, sorry, you're computing the, um, let me repeat that, right? You're, you are, you're basically taking a residual, right? You're basically computing uh, the difference between the true value and the predicted value. Uh, and then what happens is that when you are updating across two different parameters, let's say you only have two parameters in this model. The update for beta one depends on beta two directly. And then you can see the form here is that you see this is x1 transpose times x2. Well, this is basically just the uh, kind of essentially it's the covariance between uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's the inner yeah, it's the inner product. It's the inner product between uh, the the first parameter, which is uh, this is column x1, and the second parameter, which is column x2. So I apologize for the confusion, but let me repeat that again. This is the problem with two only two parameters, so you only have two data columns, x1 and x2. You take, you take x1 transpose times x2, you're basically getting how uh, if these two uh, columns are perfectly correlated with each other, you're going to get a very high number. If these two columns are not correlated with each other, you're going to get a very low number. What does that mean? If they're not correlated, this term is zero. If they're correlated, this term is non-zero, which means beta 2 affects the update to beta 1. So that's the mathematical intuition behind why correlated data columns in lasso regression uh, produce a parallelization error. It's because it allows the value of other parameters to influence the update of uh, the parameter you're optimizing over. Okay. Uh, and as I talked about before, um, there's also this idea that different parameters actually converge at different rates. Um, it turns out that the power law uh, observation is true. If you have a large lasso problem, 80%, um, 20%, uh, 20% 80% of the parameters will converge in 20% of the iterations. The remaining 20% are long tail that take forever to converge. So the overall time to convergence is actually determined by the number of iterations the slowest one takes to converge. So how do you make them converge quicker? <clears throat> um, the challenges are basically are <clears throat> that you need to be able to perform a model partitioning in order to get, <clears throat> sorry for my cough, in order to get, um, non-correlated subsets of parameters. And you also need to be able to do this uh, dynamic load balancing in order to prioritize the parameters that are taking the longest time uh, to converge. Uh, and so these are just some of the considerations that happen in model parallelism. 
just like uh, data parallelism, where we had a dichotomy between bulk synchronous parallel and asynchronous parallel, there's also a dichotomy in model parallelism where we can do a very exact graph partition, which is very expensive, or we can do a random partition, which is basically leaving it up to like shotgun uh, corner descent, which is leaving it up to luck to, as to whether it's correlated or not. Um, the middle ground um, is this idea of a structure aware parallelization which essentially um, is a system that at every step it's going to draw some parameters from the pool of all parameters to optimize. So rather than having a pre-computed graph or a random partition, we're going to take things one step at a time. We're going to be very adaptive to what the current situation model is, right? So we're going to basically, uh, instead of drawing parameters at random, we're going to draw according to a priority, which is basically how fast has the parameter changed recently? Uh, and it turns out that this very simple strategy is uh, what produced the, sharp, the sharper convergence curve I showed earlier, where you, instead of this very slow convergence towards a optimum, you get this very steep uh, convergence. And uh, especially once you've started getting estimates of what is the change per iteration of each, in each of the parameters. So that's kind of how to prioritize parameters. The, the point is that it's a very good thing to do. And then the other way is by using this matrix structured block idea, uh, kind of this matrix, uh, a non-overlapping matrix partition idea, which we showed in the topic model Gibbs sampling case, you can actually also apply this to, um, to, to lasso regression. Because there's a data matrix, I can basically have the different blocks create different sets of non-overlapping blocks and apply the exact same technique we used in the LDA case to do this. And then because these parameters uh, don't overlap, it's not necessary to synchronize between them. So whether they are faster or slower workers between them doesn't hurt as much. In fact, the way to deal with slower workers is that if they perform fewer iterations, uh, well, that's okay. I'll just continue on to the next parameter block because again, these don't overlap, so they don't hurt each other. So unlike the case where we're sharing all parameters in data parallelism, where a single slow worker operating in the wrong parameter will cause a lot of damage to all the other progress. Here, there's no damage. You can have faster workers, you can have slower workers, and that's totally okay. Uh, so combining these ideas into a single system, uh, there's a bit of programming effort required, but you can create a system that essentially, first of all, uses block scheduling to get the parameters to not overlap, and then draws parameters within each block via priority, and then lets each worker proceed at its own time, own pace, uh, and then synchronizes every now and then. And basically what we've done here is to exploit the different structural properties and convergence properties of the ML algorithm to make the system very balanced, very even, and to overcome many of the systems challenges I talked about uh, earlier. So these are just some of the convergence curves that are possible. Uh, for lasso, prioritized lasso regression, you get this sharp drop here after the initial part is actually when the system doesn't have an estimate of which parameters are the fastest or slowest. You need to complete one round of, uh, of uh, iteration before you can start prioritizing. And similarly, you can apply similar techniques to matrix factorization, LDA, and show that it actually performs better than systems that uh, use a different set of properties. Okay, um, but to skip over this. Um, okay, so as a final note, and I apologize that the lecture is, is pretty long because there's a lot of material in this, in this lecture. In fact, in the past, actually, uh, Eric and I, when we taught this course, it usually is two lectures, but we kind of had to compress this into one guest lecture today. Um, I, I'm going to go very quickly over this topic just to give you the high level intuition behind the theory that's been developed about how these real world distributed ML systems when are they correct? Basically, when do you have guarantees on convergence? Under what conditions? And uh, more importantly, if you do converge, what is the impact on the convergence rate, right? Uh, knowing that there's these computational and communication costs, uh, and knowing that, you know, in practice, many of these methods work, but the question is why? Okay. So uh, I'm going to skip over uh, this slide here um, and just talk about. Um, just talk about the intuition behind why still synchronous parallel works. So I uh, recall that uh, here, workers will basically be able, the, the view of the parameters, let's say, let's pretend there's a global parameter that all of these threads are synchronizing to. If there is a slow worker, then you're missing up to S updates from this worker. 
So you're missing some part of the full picture. You're missing somebody's code comments. You're missing somebody's email updates, right? Uh, and then what we say in still synchronous parallel is that I'm going to be able to wait up to maybe three cycles, three iterations before you can, uh, before I really have to wait and wait for the email or wait for the updates to come from this slower. So um, I'm going to put a pause here. Um, there are basically three types of convergence guarantees that are present in these systems. So one is a regret or expectation bound. This is the weakest type of bound. It just says that uh, the expected value of the parameter is you know, approaching a particular number, right? But that's not good enough because if I say that the expected value is approaching a parameter, that says I'm kind of converging, but it doesn't say, you know, um, it doesn't say anything about the distribution of the parameter because remember when you take different runs of the parallel algorithm, you get different results. It's not helpful if the expectation converges, but the spread of the different runs is so wide that none of the, with high probability, the runs are not anywhere close to an optimum. So that's what inspires the next type of bound, which is a probabilistic bound. We're basically saying that the distribution, the shape of the distribution is bounded around the optimum which is a stronger kind of guarantee, it says that, yeah, I, not only will, will this converge in expectation, with high probability, it's going to be close to the, uh, close to the true value. And then the last type of bound is the, the variance, which uh, is kind of related to the probabilistic bound in that it's, it's a way to measure the stability of the convergence. Lower variance basically means that uh, lower variance in each of the dates means that it's going to be more stable around the optimum, which means it's easier to tell when you converge. There's less noise in the convergence curve. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, this slide, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about the first bound, which is for bounded asynchronous parallel, like still synchronous parallel. Uh, there's a fairly simple theorem you can uh, derive that shows that in expectation, the difference between the true optima versus the estimate returned by the SSP system is bounded by this equation. So, what are the quantities here? Uh, L is the Lipschitz constant. That's basically how steep the gradient can be inside the objective function. Uh, we, uh, it, we, uh, S is the staleness, which is basically how many iterations apart can the workers be, and P is the number of threads. So you can see that F, P, and S all play a role inside the bound, uh, which is basically what I call the interaction between the model and system's parameters. The convergence rate is affected by both the, uh, the model properties, which is the Lipschitz constant, as well as the system's properties, the number of parallel workers and the staleness. So you can see that staleness is multiplicative with the number of workers in the worst case. So stronger guarantees on means and variances, it turns out can be proven, uh, which I'll flash briefly in a couple of slides. But first, uh, I want to talk about the biggest takeaway from this section. If you don't remember anything else, this is the one. Why does stale synchronous parallel converge? And the intuition is actually that it approximates sequential execution. So if you think about how a parallel ML program translates to sequential execution, if I have all these workers moving one step at a time, you can, you can actually create a sequential execution uh, from this by, say, going from the first block of work here to this block, to this one, to this one, then up here in this zigzag pattern. Now, what does this mean? In still synchronous parallel, we have this staleness threshold, which means that you see these two green windows. I call them error windows. It basically means that updates within these two windows could be missing or could be uh, ahead of schedule. So either the updates are behind schedule or update schedule. The intuition here is that the overlap between the union of these two windows is basically bounded by two times S minus one, and then times the number of workers C. So that's the maximum number of updates that the trajectory can be wrong by. Why is this important? So let's say we're not at iteration five, but we're at iteration 5,000. Then what you'll see is that most of the updates are already in, and the window is small relative to the total amount of work that has been done. The idea is that this window of error is always kind of a constant size, it's a constant window, but as more and more work is done, the impact of this window becomes small relative to the work that is done. That is the, so it's basically what uh, we call a partial but bounded uh, loss of zero serializability in the execution, which bounds the actual error. So this is the key intuition behind why this converges. It's also the reason why asynchronous is not guaranteed to converge, because in asynchronous execution, there is no limit on this window. So when there's a very slow worker, 
the window actually grows with time, causing, uh, causing the um, ML algorithm to possibly diverge. Okay, gonna skip over this slide. Uh, this is just an example of a probability bound, uh, similar to the expectation bound, but now we're saying that uh, with high, now you see that instead of doing checking the expectation, we're gonna say with high probability, or rather the probability of the expectation, uh, the probability that the uh, expected error is above a certain constant, is going to be exponentially getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What you need to know is that, again, the systems and ML quantities appear. Else, the difference constant. Uh, we now have uh, new, new variables such as mu, the expected amount of staleness, and sigma, the variance in the staleness. So we're now actually characterizing how the distribution of stale, uh, staleness during the trajectory of execution. That's basically what do the windows look like at each, uh, at each iteration how that actually impacts the uh, probability bound. And again, we see this occurs in the denominator of the, of the right-hand side, which means that the higher these means and variances get, the more exponentially worse your bounds get. Okay, that's a big takeaway. Uh, we can also bound the variance of the estimate, uh, which is another way of looking at the probability distribution, basically. Okay, um, empirically, uh, and this is not just in theory, in practice, you can also show that if you have good stability bounds, if you keep them as small and as tight as possible, it will help empirical performance. Uh, in fact, uh, if you have extremely high staleness, so SSP, uh, still synchronous parallel, bounded asynchronous parallel, use common sense. They're not gonna work if you allow a very, very high staleness threshold because that's starting to get towards the worst case asynchronous uh, kind of execution. And so if you do not, uh, design the system to either keep the staleness low on average or to bound the maximum staleness, you can actually have divergence inside the ML algorithm because uh, it's, the, it's the problem where different workers have different view of the model parameters and therefore their updates are actually going in uh, very non-complementary directions. Um, so there, there is some theory on how bounded asynchronous parallel applies to model parallelism. There's just a reference here not going to go into the details, but the uh, intuition is actually similar to Hogwild. Model parallel sub-problems will become uh, almost independent if you schedule properly of the problem is fast. Uh, and those uh, concepts can be used to prove convergence bounds uh, for uh, bound asynchronous parallel and model parallel. Uh, finally, the last part here, I'm just gonna show there's also theorems for the scheduled model parallel and uh, systems where you do priority scheduling and block-based scheduling. Uh, it turns out that scheduled model parallelism Converges to a bound that is actually similar to the uh, shotgun bound we showed earlier. Uh, but here, instead of the, um, this role, this spectral radius of the matrix, which I talked about earlier, being out of control, what this does is that it's actually minimizing the impact of role. Uh, so although in the worst case, fully correlated data, you can't do anything, by keeping it as small as possible, we, by searching for these independent feature subsets, we're able to get closer to the uh, optimum in the average case, right? So basically, as long as we're not given adversarial data, we can do much better than shotgun. Uh, likewise, we can also derive um, bounds on how the uh, ideal scheduling uh, impacts the distance between the true parameters. Uh, or rather, sorry, uh, here we have an ideal single machine execution, and here we have the dynamic schedule execution. And we can show that although dynamic scheduling is really an approximation because it's not looking at the uh, correlation between every single parameter at once, it turns out that it can be bounded by this quantity to the right-hand side. So under dynamic scheduling, the progress is actually nearly as good as ideal model parallelism. Uh, and uh, just another convergence curve to show you that how this plays out. Uh, and finally, for this idea of scheduling independent blocks of each other and having uh, each of the workers able to go as fast or as slow, as many or as few iterations as they like in each of these, we can actually uh, derive a bound showing that this is com a completely sound thing to do, that the variance in parameter estimates is actually going to be negligible. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated analysis, so I won't go into it. But we're going to show that the parameter variance is decreasing every iteration. These are these two terms. And there's these kind of noise terms, which are higher order, but because it's a higher order, like you know, the power of three, four, five of a very small number, turns out to be negligible in practice. Uh, similarly, um, 
these are just two different variants bounds for the parameter difference between and within blocks. Um, kind of a detail here, I'm going to skip over it, uh, but this is just to show you how deep the analysis can go. Uh, and empirically, um, these systems that schedule blocks in a very smart way outperform GraphLab and outperform other ways of uh, scheduling that are not low balanced or not or very computationally expensive. Okay. All right. Um, I, uh, that is the end of the lecture. Uh, for, for those of you who stayed until the end, um, thank you very much. I understand it was a lot of content. Uh, it's a lot of very heavy content here. But I hope what I've given you is kind of a high-level overview of the most important concepts and intuitions behind the design of scalable ML algorithms and systems. Um, so thank you very much.